I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Bruce Willis claims that John McClane is very close to his real-life personality. A cool, wise-cracking, charming dude living a life full of action. After many adventures, he has become jaded, even bored of the action-packed thrill ride that is cinema and life. His movies have made over three billion dollars, making him one of the most profitable movie stars of all time. Which is a great accomplishment for a guy who never took the spotlight serious. He is one of the few 80s action stars that is also respected as an actor. Bruce is everything from a quiet, everyday man to a loudmouth action hero, and even a raccoon. He's also a ghost. Spoiler alert. He's a rock star, a cartoon, and he's even been described as a mega jerk sometimes. But Ashton Kutcher likes him. He has blessed the silver screen with some of the finest films from many genres for decades. But everyone now seems to say that Bruce Willis has stopped caring. But why? One question seems to be on everybody's mind, and that question is, what the f*** happened to Bruce Willis? Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. To truly understand what happened to our dear Bruno, we must start at the beginning. This all-American action hero was born in Germany and raised in New Jersey. Bruce was an aspiring actor slash musician who was living the wild party life as a popular bartender in New York City. He was cast on the hit TV show Moonlighting. It was his big breakout, even though Bruce Willis had no respect for television. He auditioned anyway and beat out thousands of young men. The show's creator knew that Bruce was perfect, but the studio didn't think he was a leading man. But Bruce's charm and confidence eventually won over the studio. And then, the world. He was an overnight star and won an Emmy for his performance. But Mr. Willis did not get along with Sybil Shepherd very well. They fought a lot on set. Right away, word got out that Bruce Willis was difficult to work with. And the reputation stayed forever. Eventually, Bruce felt that the story and the characters were going nowhere, and the TV show had just turned into two people yelling at each other. It was no longer fun for Bruce. He was eager to burst out of the confines of 80s television. His first motion picture on the big screen was a movie called Blind Date, and many people enjoyed it. But in 1988 came the groundbreaking, influential action blockbuster Die Hard. Welcome to the party, pal! Bruce was a new type of action hero. The world was used to muscle heads from the 80s like Stallone and Schwarzenegger, but now they had a more relatable character, as relatable as a terrorist fighting cop can be. He's still a strong guy who can kick ass, but he's more delicate and can actually get hurt and feel emotions. Real emotions, like love. He's not just a superhuman killing machine, he's just a human with a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. It is his pain that makes us root for John McClane, and his fast-talking jokes, of course, plus the love of his family and his jolly Christmas spirit. But of course, not everyone was welcoming Bruce into the world of movies. Many people thought letting a TV actor carry a big action movie was crazy, but sometimes crazy is the ingredient to perfection. And that's what Die Hard is, perfect. Bruce is perfect, and I hate using the word perfect, but I'm gonna use it here because Die Hard is perfect. Perfect. And even though Bruce was still starting out in the movie biz, he was able to earn slash negotiate an unheard of $5 million paycheck for Die Hard. This led to every single actor in Hollywood demanding a pay raise. And just like the building, Bruce blew up. But was Hollywood ready for a new breed of superstar? Of course not, but there was no choice. Bruce was here to stay. But after that, pretty much nothing but diehard clones were offered to Bruce, and he didn't want to do that. He was not interested in just doing action movie after action movie after action movie. He now had the money and the fame to experiment and take chances and have fun with diverse characters. The next year, he took on a very challenging and dramatic role in the film, In Country. He gave a Golden Globe nominated performance as a Vietnam veteran who suffers from PTSD. Bruce Willis showed the world that he was a legitimate dramatic actor. Like there's this hole in my heart. There's just something missing, I can't get it back. At that same time, he also voiced the talking baby Mikey in Look Who's Talking. 
alongside his future Pulp Fiction co-star John Travolta. Apparently Bruce would throw in a lot of improvised, X-rated jokes, but they were all cut from this family film. I wonder if there's an R-rated director's cut. Look who the f*** is talking. Look Who's Talking was a very big hit, and it led to a sequel. Look Who's Talking 2. T-O-O. When you have to pee, you jump up and down, but sometimes nothing has to come out. So you try to jump up and down a little more. Speaking of sequels, Bruce kicked off the 90s by dying harder in Die Hard 2, Die Harder. It's a fun sequel, but it's almost too much of a sequel, if you know what I mean. It's like copying and pasting the first Die Hard, and then it just changes it to an airport. I believe there's even a few lines where Bruce says something like, I can't believe the same thing is happening to the same guy twice. Oh my god, this is unbelievable, but it's happening. And it was unbelievable, and it happened. So most of the time when I do my annual Die Hard movie marathon, I skip number two and go right to Vengeance, which we'll get to later. Shh, it's okay done this before. Then came the infamous Bonfire of the Vanities. This film was a huge commercial and critical flop, and there's even a best-selling novel about all the behind-the-scenes drama of making this mess of a movie. Director Brian De Palma wanted Jack Nicholson for the role, but the studio forced him to cast this rising star. It's never a good sign if the director doesn't want you. Willis and De Palma clashed on set, and according to the tell-all book that I did not read, Bruce's ego was a major obstacle for the cast and crew. And because of the major failure of Bonfire of the Vanities, Bruce learned that he's not invincible at the box office. Not unbreakable. He can break. But could we fix him? We'll find out. Stay tuned. Then he did a film called Mortal Thoughts alongside his then-wife Demi Moore. They were Hollywood's it couple for years, until they weren't. But it was a marriage that lasted a long time in Hollywood years. He used to be such a happy-go-lucky guy. Well, I'm very happy-go-lucky. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, we're partying, baby. Then there was the Hudson Hawk, which was marketed as a traditional action flick, but it's really a cartoonish romp, which confused audiences and made them think that they didn't like the movie. Well, the few who saw it, because it lost millions at the box office and critics tore it apart too. But I hear it's aged very well, like a fine wine. And it's found a new life and a cult following on DVD, or whatever it is you kids watch nowadays. Bruce even had a hand in crafting the story on this one. But film critic Gene Siskel complained that every character in the film was trying way too hard to be funny. Bruce had a supporting role in the Dustin Hoffman gangster film, Billy Bathgate. It was another box office flop and a dud with the critics. In 1991, he did The Last Boy Scout. It was a fun action flick produced by Joel Silver, directed by Tony Scott, and written by Shane Black. And all the clashing masculine egos on set created a very hostile environment. Bruce and Damon Wayans hated working with each other, even though they have nice buddy chemistry on the screen. They are such talented actors that they can make it seem like they don't hate each other. Now that's impressive. There were lots of production problems, but the final result is a nice action movie. Where'd you get this suit, Grandpa? Gangsters arrest? <laughs> <laughs> He hilariously spoofed himself in Robert Altman's The Player. This showed us that Bruce had a sense of humor about his place in Hollywood. Death Becomes Her was his next movie, and he got to play a very different type of character. A weaker, timid person showing off his sense of humor. It's fun silliness. Look, everybody, Bruce Willis has range. He's more than just an action meathead. He's an actor, a real actor, dare I say. A comedian, an artist, all of the above. He's just Bruce Willis, he can do it all, and Death Becomes Her proved it once again. He said yes to the project because he wanted to work with Robert Zemeckis, and because Kevin Klein dropped out. Let's just calm down, I'm sure we can settle this peacefully in the- In 1993, he played a guy named Tom Hardy in the film Striking Distance. Once again doing the action thing, and once again he clashed with the director. Then he headed north in Rob Reiner's film North, which is a horrible, horrible movie about a boy traveling the world in search of new parents. 
and Bruce Willis plays the Easter Bunny for some reason. And then there was the sexy thriller, Color of Night. At this point in Bruce Willis' career, he really, really needed a hit. And Pulp Fiction came at the right time. <laughs> like Travolta, this masterpiece served as a major comeback for Bruce Willis. Now, his star had not fallen as far as John Travolta's, but after a series of flops, he was definitely heading there. And Bruce was perfect as Butch. The role was even rewritten to fit Bruce Willis better. He took a huge pay cut, but it definitely paid off, cause, cause Pulp Fiction. And after a string of flops, this was Bruce's comeback, and it was one hell of a comeback. One of the best films of all time. Then there was Nobody's Fool, which he said yes without even reading the script. He just wanted to work with Paul Newman. He loves his salad dressing, I guess. The rave reviews for this film definitely helped keep up his comeback. This was followed by the third installment to the Die Hard franchise, Die Hard with a Vengeance, which started out as an original screenplay called Simon Says that the studio was planning on turning into a Lethal Weapon sequel, but eventually the script found its hero in John McClane. I love this movie. Die Hard with a Vengeance is amazing, very underrated, great action, great suspense, wonderful characters, it's just a thrilling good time. This movie was the highest grossing movie worldwide of 1995. Bruce was back with a vengeance. He teamed up with the great Tarantino again in four rooms, and he got to work with the great Terry Gilliam in the big budget Hollywood adaptation of Le Jete called Twelve Monkeys. One of Bruce's best films, one of the best sci-fi films ever made in my opinion, one of the best time travel films of all time. Bruce is great as our protagonist. We get to see a lost and confused, sensitive side of Brucey boy, and a wild and crazy side too. He gets to do a lot with this character. And once again, he took a huge pay cut to be a part of this wonderful film. Another action flick came with Last Man Standing. Bruce plays a badass gunslinger who gets tied up with the Mafia. This is a reimagining of the western A Fistful of Dollars, which was a reimagining of the samurai flick Yojimbo. So it's not a reboot of a reboot, it's a reimagining of a reimagining. He did the cartoon voice thing in Beavis and Butthead Do America and Bruno the Kid, the animated movie based on the animated TV show Bruno the Kid, where he plays an 11-year-old spy version of himself as a kid. It's some trippy meta stuff. For a kid show, that is. In The Fifth Element, he plays a cab driver who gets caught in the middle of a space opera adventure. This sci-fi epic was directed by the great Luc Besson and is the perfect vehicle for Bruce's skills. He's a tough guy who loves to make wisecracks while saving the day. It's my favorite type of Bruce Willis character. It's fun, it's loud, it's original, and it even has heart. Bruce accepted the film within two hours of reading the script. I love The Fifth Element and The Fifth Element loves me. <laughs> Anybody else want to negotiate? He was the Jackal in The Jackal, a remake of The Day of the Jackal. And surprise, surprise, Bruce didn't get along with his co-star Richard Gere. And the two vowed never to work together again. Seems like Bruce Willis makes enemies with every new movie he makes. Mercury Rising came next, and that was an interesting action flick. It was okay. I liked it. But he clashed with the director again. Then he saved the world in Armageddon, and say what you want about this movie, this movie is what it is, and it achieved exactly what they were going for. Like it or not. Lots of sweeping camera work, lots of exploding explosions, lots of crazy characters, and lots of... lots of death. Which is a sign of a great Michael Bay movie. It has everything you want and more, much, much more from Michael Bay and Bruce Willis. But of course, the egos of Bruce Willis and Michael Bay clashed on set and Bruce said he would never work with Michael Bay ever again. The film made tons of money and it made the apocalypse seem cool. It has a wonderful ensemble cast, including his pal, the late great Michael Clark Duncan. And it was Bruce Willis who got Duncan the chance to audition for The Green Mile, and the rest is history. But yeah, Armageddon, it's like Deep Impact, but exciting. Then there was the action thriller, The Siege, which is a very interesting film about terrorist attacks in New York City. This film came out in 1998, 
but was transformed into a much more meaningful film after the terrorist attacks of September 2001. So the siege kind of took on a new life because of real-world events. It's directed by the great Edward Zwick, and Bruce is always good as a military man. The siege. I hear Breakfast of Champions is really, really bad. I've never seen it, but it looks like Bruce gets to show off his silly side again in this Kurt Vonnegut Jr. adaptation. I think this is one of the times where you can say with great confidence that the book was better. I know things that can make your head spin. My head spins all the time. I'm trying to make it stop. Ooh. Then came The Sixth Sense. Bruce gives a quiet yet powerful performance in this mega blockbuster. It was the surprise sleeper hit of 1999. The best year for movies ever. This slow burn paranormal thriller shook audiences and made so much money. The Sixth Sense was nominated for lots of Oscars, and this is one of the first films where I started noticing filmmaking techniques. I remember watching the special features and listening to everything that M. Night Shyamalan had to say. It's like, whoa, he uses the color red for like artistic reasons, for like the story? It was, it was a mind opening for me as a movie watcher. So The Sixth Sense will always have a special place in my heart. And my nightmares. That vomit girl scene, it scared the vomit out of me. And it seems like Bruce actually kind of gets along with the director on this one. Because M. Night Shyamalan and Bruce would go on to work together again. Their bond is unbreakable. In fact, M. Night Shyamalan wrote The Sixth Sense with Bruce in mind. This film put Bruce Willis back on top again. Hollywood was like, welcome back, Bruce. Here is your throne at the top again. Sit on it until you get bored. I see dead people. Also in 1999, he worked with Rob Reiner again in The Story of Us, and Bruce brought on the new millennium with the hilarious gangster comedy, The Whole Nine Yards. The film was successful and led to a sequel, and no, that sequel was not called The Whole Nine Yards 2, it was called, wait for it, The Whole Ten Yards because 10 is one more than nine, if you believe in numbers. And it seems like Bruce really likes numbers. Lots of his movies have numbers in the title. Four Rooms, The Fifth Element, Sixth Sense, Lucky Number Slevin, The Whole Nine Yards, The Whole Ten Yards, 10 Minutes Gone, 12 Monkeys, Ocean's 12, 16 Blocks, Catch 44, and I'm not even counting the sequels with two in the title. And he even had a cameo in Loaded Weapon 1, if that counts. But let's get back to the whole nine yards, shall we? Bruce is so funny as the tough guy gangster alongside Matthew Perry, and they have great chemistry together. Bruce actually got along with Perry. And this led to his buddy Bruce appearing on an episode of Friends, for which he won an Emmy. Congratulations, Bruce. I think Ross dates his daughter and then he sleeps with Rachel, and uh, everybody in the audience laughs at the right moments. That was so good. <laughs> <laughs> then he did Disney's The Kid, which I always thought was a remake of the classic Charlie Chaplin film, but no, it's about Bruce Willis meeting a younger version of himself, like Looper, but less violent, and 12 Monkeys, but with less monkeys, and even Bruno the Kid in a way. It seems like Bruce Willis's favorite co-star is young Bruce Willis. Then Bruce Willis helped reimagine the modern comic book superhero movie before the modern comic book superhero movie even really existed. It was the incredible, unbreakable. Bruce is once again perfectly cast in this M. Night Shyamalan thriller about the sole survivor of a deadly train crash. This is your classic superhero origin story, but it's told in a realistic, grounded way. The film honestly asks the question, what if someone had superpowers? What would happen? What would they feel? Drama. It's so refreshing to see such a film. We get the strong, silent Bruce Willis in this one, and he teams up with his Die Hard 3 and Pulp Fiction co-star Samuel L. Jackson as Mr. Glass. That's what the kids called him. This dark character study reminded us all why we love to see Bruce Willis up on the silver screen. And it's actually M. Night's favorite film of his own. Lots of people love this one, including me. I'm one of those people. <laughs> then there was the delightful crime comedy Bandits, where two bank robbers fall in love with their hostage. It's a crazy fun time. 
Billy Bob and Kate Blanchett were both nominated for Golden Globes, and Bruce Willis was not. But he's good too. He did the World War II drama Hearts War, and he was randomly in a low-budget kids movie about a cow called Grand Champion. Then there was the thrilling war flick Tears of the Sun. Bruce sued the studio for trauma. He claimed that he suffered from extreme physical and emotional pain as a result from acting in this movie. And once again, Bruce Willis clashed with the director, Antoine Fuquet, both vowing never to work with each other again. I'm seeing a pattern here. Hey, are there any Rugrat fans out there? Remember when those stupid babies teamed up with the Wild Thornberries and made a movie and that movie was called Rugrats Go Wild? Remember? You remember that? And remember Tommy's dog, Spike? Remember? Ever wonder what Spike would sound like if he had a human voice? Well, wonder no more, cause this movie answers that age-old question. He sounds like Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis is Spike. Spike is Bruce Willis. And featuring the voice of Bruce Willis as Spike. I am so grateful. I don't know whether to give you a big kiss or just slobber all over you from top to bottom. A kiss would be fine. Who wants a tongue bath? He played himself again in the stupid, horrible Ocean's 12 with a stupid, horrible cameo. Hate this movie. And the year 2005 brought on the film Hostage, which is very underrated. It was produced independently and picked up by everyone's favorite producer, Harvey Weinstein. The film features his real-life daughter and real-life beard. Bruce plays a hostage negotiator who has to stop Ben Foster, who's scary as f in this one. Then came Sin City. Robert Rodriguez brought to life this graphic novel unlike anything we had ever seen before. The film literally looks like a comic coming to life, and Bruce is once again perfectly cast in this gritty, dark, violent crime saga. I was so excited to see this movie when it first came out, I had never seen anything like it before. And I'm from San Antonio, which is Robert Rodriguez's hometown, so it felt, you know, personal. So I remember rushing to the theater on opening day, getting there hours before showtime because I assumed the rest of the world was as interested in this film as I was and I didn't want it to sell out. But no, there were plenty of seats in the theater. But the film was very successful. Successful enough to get a sequel. Like, ten years too late. Nobody cared about that one. But yeah, the first Sin City? Me likes it. Then he joined forces with his BFF slash ex-wife's trophy husband at the time, Ashton Kutcher. And he did a funny guest appearance on that 70s show. Then there was a series of so-so decent films. Nothing great, but nothing bad. Films like 16 Blocks, Lucky Number Slevin, The Astronaut Farmer, Alpha Dog, Over the Hedge, and Fast Food Nation, which I'm actually in. I play a high school student in the background. See me? Right there. Look at that. And he worked with Robert Rodriguez again on his half of Grindhouse in Planet Terror, which Bruce Willis plays a zombie hunting military man who I believe says killed Bin Laden. And that was kind of a funny joke because at the time Bin Laden was alive. I don't really know if you call it a joke, it's just like a, it's just a thing. Bruce Willis is well known for his support of the troops. He is one of the most unapologetically patriotic stars out there. Bruce even tried to enlist, but they did not accept him because he was too famous and too old. So he visited the troops in Iraq and even performed some concerts. And he hypothetically offered $1 million to anyone who turns in Osama Bin Laden. Here's a fun fact, Bruce Willis hates Osama Bin Laden. Yes, Bruce has always been a Hollywood outsider when it comes to politics. He's a pro-gun Republican, and that's a big no-no in the tolerant Hollyweird. But nowadays, he tries not to label himself with a political party and just says that he's anti-big government. You're right. You're That's totally it. right. <laughs> uh, you're totally right. Well, But I don't think his political beliefs have ever affected his career in a negative way, or even in a positive way, which is how it should be. Nobody should care who Bruce Willis votes for. But enough talk about politics, let's talk about things that are really important. Movies. Bruce Willis was in a Halle Berry movie, and it was a stinker. It was called Perfect Stranger, and it was not perfect. And in 2007, we got to see Bruce return to the role that made him a star, John McClane. He brought back John into the movie world with the film Live Free or Die Hard. Now, this film is alright. I like it. 
Bruce does a fine job, but it doesn't really feel like a Die Hard movie to me. Like, this time he drives a car into a helicopter, and he jumps off an exploding jet, and it doesn't work for me. And it's mother PG-13. PG-13 Die Hard movie with Justin Long? It's okay, though. It's, it's, I'm being too harsh. And this was Kevin Smith's first experience with working with Bruce, uh, but we'll get to that later. Who is this man? He's my... Hey, dump truck. I'm not his dad. I'm a cop. How about that? I'm oh, a, police a show. cop. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Why'd you bring a cop into my command center? <laughs> command center. He played the principal in an interesting flick called Assassination of a High School President, and an interesting sci-fi futuristic film called Surrogates, which came out in 2009 and takes place in the future of 2017. But Bruce was not interested in being professional on this one either. Stubborn old Bruno refused to re-record some of his lines of dialogue, so a sound-alike had to be brought in to record some of Bruce Willis's lines. That's not cool. Or is it cool? He then played himself again in the film What Just Happened, where he goes on an all-too-real rant about his feelings on acting and the state of his career. You want to talk about integrity? Let's talk about... Yeah, let's talk about integrity! Let's talk about some right, fucking let's integrity! Go. Okay, let's go! Let's talk about integrity! Then 2010 brought us the film Cop Out, where Bruce Willis copped out of being a decent human being. He feuded with director Kevin Smith, Mr. Smith called working with his hero a soul-crushing and beyond disappointing experience. Bruce had no respect for the clerk's director, and he openly showed it. Willis was not pleased with Smith's directing style and use of marijuana. Bruce also refused to listen to Kevin's directions. He would spend most of the time at the catering table and would intentionally flub his lines just to waste time. Bruce wouldn't even show up to take a photo for the poster. So the poster features a computer-generated Bruce Willis. And rumor has it Bruce almost beat up Kevin in a hotel room. And much, much more. And funny enough, Kevin Smith has actually kind of made a career out of talking about what it's like to work with Bruce Willis. Kevin talking about the movie is way more entertaining than actually watching this movie. If you can even call this a movie. <laughs> Then came The Expendables. It was a disappointing dream come true to see all of my favorite action stars up there together on the screen, and all the hype about how Arnold, Sylvester, and Bruce were all gonna share the screen. It, it was huge. Then I actually watched the movie, and it had its good moments, but the build-up for a stupid, actionless scene of my three favorite Planet Hollywood heroes, they were just standing there in a church talking, making stupid jokes. It was... It was a major, a major lit down. They're all there, do something with them. You got the three biggest action stars in the world and they're right there in your frame. And they're just gonna, they're just gonna stand there in an empty church. Talk about expendable. Then there was Red, which was nominated for best musical and or comedy at the Golden Globes. But this was followed by yet another series of stinkers, films like Set Up with 50 Cent, Catch 44, Lay the favorite, and the direct-to-video Fire with Fire. But the apocalyptic year of 2012 was good to Bruce Willis, with films like Looper and Moonrise Kingdom, and even Expendables 2. But let's start with Looper. Joseph Gordon-Levitt ruined his pretty face to look more like a young Bruce, and I appreciate that they tried this, but it always felt a little weird to me. It, it took me out of the film that I otherwise enjoyed, except for the finale. But lots of people love and respect Looper. I don't love it, but I, I respect its clever concept. This is from the brilliant mind of the brilliant director, Ryan Johnson, the guy who ruined Star Wars. Bruce Willis also joined the prestigious Wes Anderson super team in Moonrise Kingdom. And what can I say about this film other than it's a Wes Anderson movie? If you've seen a Wes Anderson movie, you pretty much know what that means. And it's usually a wonderful thing. Bruce fits right into Wes's quirky, symmetrical world of hipster silliness. I'm declaring a case with the county right now. Until help arrives, I'm deputizing the little guy, the skinny one, and the boy with the patch on his eye to come with me in the station wagon. Randy, you drop in and head upriver with the rest of your troops, split up on foot. 
and Expendables 2, where Bruce gets a bigger part and he actually gets involved in the action this time with Sly and the gang. Arnold and Bruce actually steal each other's famous lines, and it's a nice little moment of cinema. I'll be back. You've been back enough. I'll be back. Yippee-ki-yay. He wasn't in Expendables 3 because he was demanding, like, all the money in the world just for a few days of shooting, and Sylvester Stallone publicly called out his old buddy on Twitter, calling him greedy and lazy. Action Star versus Action Star in real life. On social media. It was kind of lame. Then came the horrendous A Good Day to Die Hard. Unbelievable stupid action that takes you right out of the movie if you were ever in the movie to begin with. It takes the most lovable action hero of the 80s and transforms him into a grumpy old man with some big guns and some Jai Courtney. This joke of a diehard movie is a father and son spy movie in Mother Russia. You can feel Bruce Willis's boredom and you can feel John McClane's boredom coming off the screen. It's like if John McClane had an off-screen last action hero adventure with Little Danny, and just like Jack Slater, John McClane discovers that he's a immortal fictional character in a movie franchise, and now McClane just sleepwalks his way through his sequels because he knows it's all BS. That's what this feels like. Like a guy who knows that he's been last action heroed. Now, I'm not sure what day is a good day to die hard, but every day is a good day to not watch this movie. Let's just pretend that it never happened. Jack off! There was G.I. Joe Retaliation, where he plays Joe. I've never seen any of the G.I. Joe movies, but I hear nothing but bad things. Should I watch these films, or should I just move on with my life without them? Comment your comments in the comments! For some reason, they made a sequel to Red called Red 2, but this time they added Catherine Zeta-Jones. Because that makes things better. But it wasn't. And his awkward and rude publicity interview overshadowed this lame sequel. This part is not acting. What we're doing right now, you might be. But we're just selling the film now. Sales. That fun part was making the movie. fun part happened, yeah. So, how would you sell me the film then? How, what would you say that is I the would, best part about the film? I would slash my hooves. No, I love this film. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. He worked with his Moonrise Kingdom co-star Bill Murray again in Rock the Kashba, and then he did a ton of video-on-demand movies like Precious Cargo, Vice, Extraction, where he filmed all of his scenes in one day, and The Prince, another 50-cent movie where he also filmed all of his scenes in one day. Yet another spoiler alert is coming. He was in the last scene of M. Night Shyamalan's Split, which was the best surprise cameo ever. And I remember going to see Split on opening day, and I really wasn't too excited about it, but I actually enjoyed the film much more than I thought I would. And I had just watched Unbreakable, so the theme, the score, was still fresh in my head. And in that final scene, with the camera slowly moving through the diner. And I hear that unbreakable score. And at first I thought, why is M. Night Shyamalan recycling his music? But then as the camera got closer and closer, I realized what they were doing and my dreams, my cinematic dreams were coming true right there and it was the greatest thing ever. David Dunn was a part of the Split universe, unbreakable and split together the twist was that this was a sequel to Unbreakable, and that coming soon was a movie where they were gonna fight each other? Oh my gosh, I could not contain my excitement. I was audibly making noises of excitement out loud in the theater, and I was kind of the only one. Oh my god, this it's happening, it's happening! Ah. And everyone was kind of looking around, confused look on their face. And actually, after the movie, during the credits, I actually had a crowd around me in the theater, and I was explaining to them. I was like, listen up, children. Back in the year of the 2000, there was a movie called Unbreakable. And the twist of this movie is that they are in a shared universe. And they all looked at me like, oh, that's it? That's why you were screaming? 
But it was, it was amazing to me. It was one of the best movie-going experiences I ever had. Then there was something called Marauders in 2016, and something called First Kill in 2017, followed by something called Reprisal in 2018, and Acts of Violence, another film that only took him one day to film. One day out of old Brucey's schedule there. Then there was Once Upon a Time in Venice, a horrible movie where Bruce Willis gets naked and skateboards down the street. And for some reason, Eli Roth made a remake of Death Wish, and for some reason, Bruce Willis is in it. And let's not forget the mega flop Airstrike. It cost over $65 million to make and made less than $1 million back at the box office. And it has a whopping 0% on those tomatoes that are rotting.com. Then there was Glass, the long awaited sequel to Unbreakable and Split. This film was built up way too much in my mind, as you know, so anything less than perfection would be disappointment to me, and it kinda was. Although I did really enjoy most of Glass, it was a little disappointing. It wasn't what I had imagined. I was picturing a something different, a epic superhero movie that was still grounded with all my favorite characters in the shared universe. I don't know, maybe I didn't get it, but I tried really, really, really hard to like this movie, and I, I liked I liked most of it. I'll give it another chance one day. He had a fun cameo in Lego Movie 2. It was awesome, because everything's awesome. Then there was Motherless Brooklyn, which I haven't seen yet, but I'm sure Edward Norton overshadowed Bruce Willis in every way possible. Then came another string of stinkers that nobody's ever heard of. Films like Ten Minutes Gone, Trauma Center, where he filmed all of his scenes in two days, and Survive the Night. And if you look at Bruce's IMDb future projects, it seems like he has no plan of slowing down when it comes to making these types of movies, unfortunately. But a guy's gotta work. And there's the rumored McLean, which I hear could possibly be a Die Hard prequel, which is at least something different than the last few Die Hard movies but I have no faith in the director, Lens Wiseman. Just doesn't seem to fit, in my mind. I could be wrong, I'm usually wrong. But I don't know, maybe they could do a looper thing and throw a young Bruce Willis face on Joseph Gordon-Levitt again and do flashbacks. Like I, I'm picturing a gritty 80s crime drama that cuts back and forth between young and old John McClane, like The Godfather Part Two, but not as good. Or we could just stop making Die Hard movies that's an option. They kind of need to die. Hard. <laughs> Happy trails, Hans. So what the f happened to Bruce Willis? How did he go from making these amazing cinema classics to making these direct-to-video piles of garbage that shouldn't even be called movies? After all of my days and days of research, I figured it out. Bottom line, Bruce is bored. Bored of his fame. Bored of his success. So he just does it for the money. He's publicly stated that he's tired of it all and just wants paychecks. And I get it, I like money. But I mean, come on, Bruce, come on. I know there's an artist in you somewhere. Bring him back out. Plus his reputation of being a big jerk face in Hollywood has definitely made casting directors look the other way. Nowadays, watching Bruce Willis squirm during interviews is more entertaining than watching actual Bruce Willis movies. Like, grumpy Bruce Willis fighting the paparazzi is more entertaining than grumpy Bruce Willis fighting anything in his new movies. And you know what? He can never make another good movie again, and I would be totally fine as long as he continues to bitch about his recent filmography, and as long as he keeps up being a hilarious grumpy old man. There was even an In Between Two Ferns interview with Bruce Willis, and it wasn't much different than a real Bruce Willis interview. When you were making the whole 10 yards, were you ever worried that it would be too good? So he's become a spoof of himself, and you know what? It's hilarious. Maybe we should look at it as performance art. You know what? I take it all back, Bruce. Keep doing this. This is your art. Calling out these entertainment journalists and pointing out the stupidity of the Hollywood system. You know what, we need you, Bruce, and I'm, I'm glad you're a grumpy, horrible a-hole. Everybody needs an a-hole. 
or else we would explode with poop. And like I said, he doesn't care anymore. And if Bruce Willis doesn't care, then we ain't gonna care either. And I don't care. Caring is overrated. So let's just sit back, relax, watch Die Hard, Pulp Fiction, 12 Monkeys, and Looper on loop, and just forget about all those other Bruce Willis movies, because you know what? F*** them. And just the thought of another Die Hard movie makes me cringe. But I'll still go see it anyway. Uh. <laughs>